cynic is a person who shows a disposition to disbelieve in the sincerity or goodness of human motives and actions, and is wont to express this by sneers and sarcasms. And cynicism is the belief that people are generally selfish and dishonest. These words are thrown around as insults and seem to have been equated with being excessively negative or nihilistic. However, there is nothing in the definitions to support those assertions. I think the most appropriate way to define a cynic is a fault finder. But because finding faults in people or their ideas is seen as rude, cynicism has gotten a bad reputation. People are almost afraid of hearing bad things about themselves, so it is easy to see why it is considered disrespectful to be cynical. However, as a self-proclaimed cynic, I think there are advantages to being cynical that are too often overlooked. First off, if you believe that everyone is self-serving, you constantly question people's intentions, and that prevents you from placing blind faith into something. Here at Asheville School, we put a huge emphasis on free thinking and skepticism, but how many of us have fallen into blind faith of optimism? I've never understood the allure of optimism and how just believing that things will get better will make them better. To me, optimism seems passive, which is why I favor cynicism. Cynicism prompts action because distrust creates an opportunity to challenge and change things. In philosopher Julian Beghini's article, In Praise of Cynicism, he writes that, I often feel that cynical is a term of abuse hurled at people who are judged to be insufficiently positive by those who believe that negativity is the real cause of almost all the world's ills. This allows them to breezily sweep aside skeptical doubts without having to go to the bother of checking if they are well-grounded. I agree with Beghini in that too often our legitimate doubts cast aside as mere pessimism. There is nothing illegitimate about questioning something, but since people believe that they or their ideas are the best, they become defensive and decide that any skepticism is not a valid concern to them. This seems ironic, because if people actually address flaws, they could create something stronger. Fault finding, as counterintuitive as it seems, is crucial to improving anything. If you can identify what's wrong with something, you can fix it. But if you only see its positive aspects, you've made it weaker. For example, when writing argumentative essays, we are taught to include a counterargument, <coughs> which allows us to acknowledge the weaknesses in our thesis, prove them wrong, and ultimately improve our paper. I believe that cynicism is like a counterargument to life. It allows you to find your flaws and try to better yourself. But cynicism, like any philosophy, must be used in moderation. I was attracted to cynicism because, as Beghini writes, only by confronting head-on the, the reality that all progress, progress is going to be obstructed by vested interests and corrupted by human venality, can we create realistic programs that actually have a chance of success. When I first adopted my cynical mindset, I did not realize the importance of not being overly cynical. I soon fell down cynicism's slippery slope, and one part of my life that suffered was field hockey. I began to question and find faults in every motive Coach Davis or the captains would make, and I spread negativity. The week before girls' sports day, we always did symbolic activities to prepare for the game, such as hitting balls at the enemy team's bench, or carrying that bench down to the soccer field and back up again. When I voiced my doubts about the usefulness of such activities, I was reprimanded and my concerns were dismissed. But I believed I was just being realistic. Finally, Coach Davis had to have an intervention about my negative attitude, and I was benched for the next game, and had my varsity letter called into question. But as Coach Davis tried to pull me towards optimism, I became even more cynical. I'm not saying that I should have abandoned my cynical attitude and put on a positive mask like I felt Katie, Maddie, and Coach Davis wanted me to do, but that I might have realized that excessive cynicism is just as pointless as empty optimism. It was not until after the field hockey season had ended that I realized the key to using cynicism as a vessel for improvement is to use ba balanced cynical analysis to navigate around failure. The right amount of cynicism gives us a realistic idea of progress because it allows us to foresee what might obstruct us from reaching our goals. When someone is not cynical enough, he or she demonstrates a phenomenon that the neurologist Tally Sherritt describes in her TED Talk as the optimism bias, which is our tendency to overestimate our likelihood of experiencing good events in our lives and underestimate our likelihood of experiencing bad events. This bias is wired into our brain, brains and is probably why most people believe that we should just be positive. But just because optimism promotes positive thinking 
doesn't necessarily mean that unchecked positivity is healthy or helpful. Sherrod states optimism can lead to rash behavior, and Beghini similarly writes, the optimist underestimates how difficult it is to achieve real change, believing that anything is possible and is possible now. Sherrod demonstrates the presence of the optimism bias to her audience with a short activity I would like to share with you. I want you to rate yourself in the top 25%, middle 50%, or bottom 25% of the people in this category, in this chapel, in each of the five categories. <laughs> they are how well you get along with others, how interesting are you, how attractive are you, how honest are you, and how modest are you. Now where did you place yourself? I'm willing to bet that just like the audience at Sherrod's TED Talk, most of you put yourself in the top 25% for each category. This activity alerts us to the presence of the optimism bias and hopefully shows us that we need to use cynicism to fight it. The bias tells us we are better than the person sitting next to us. It also gives us the dangerous idea that we don't need to try and improve ourselves because we are already the best. We constantly need to remind ourselves to be cynical and realistic because our, brain, our biased brains tell us we don't need to improve, which is never the case. The quote my brother Ken read from the Murakami's The Wind Up Bird Chronicle depicts a scene where the protagonist, Toru Okada, is explaining to his young neighbor May that she is a pessimist. She replies to Okada saying, I don't know much about the world, but I do know one thing for sure. If I'm pessimistic, then the adults in this world who are not pessimistic are a bunch of idiots. When I read this passage, I fell in love with it because it articulated just what I've been thinking. And as Brad as her statement sounds, May has a point. Doesn't it seem idiotic not to create the best version of ourselves? How can we grow if we aren't cynical and we gloss over all of our weaknesses? We need to focus on bettering ourselves and we need to be fault finders. Because as ironically optimistic as it sounds, how can we improve anything if we can't see its faults? <laughs>